I am a American Buddhist monk currently in Hanoi, Vietnam, and in the midst of a three-month range retreat, three months meditation retreat here in, in Hanoi. We are uh, practicing here according to the method of doing only, experiencing only, uh, using only, with mindfulness and detachment. So whatever person we are in contact with is to be used only and experienced only for mindfulness and detachment and for doing good deeds. Any place or situation or thing that we encounter is to be uh, experienced only and used only uh, and detached from for the purpose of mindfulness and detachment and doing good deeds. This is the meditation method that's not easy to understand, but is very powerful and is actually a kind of uh, Zen, Zen meditation method, we can say. And this is the method that's being taught by my, uh, my master, my teacher, Seattle Otamasara, who is a meditation master from Myanmar and uh, one of the, uh, the monks on the forefront of uh, modern monastic social work and uh, the redistribution of resources as well um, through the donations that uh, he is a very famous monk. Very, He has been a full-time meditation teacher and monk for more than 20 years. So he is having a lot of support, a lot of donations, and all of those donations are being used uh, for the people in Tabarwa centers worldwide who are hopeless and helpless, many of them. So feeding, housing, uh, sheltering, teaching, medical care, uh, everything that you can imagine he is uh, working to provide for. And this is all happening according to the generosity of people. It's happening through generosity and it's being done in a, uh, a way that is not about um, grasping onto a particular way of doing things or a particular person or a particular experience, but doing for all and doing according to the truth, the ultimate truth of ever new impermanent nature. So the ultimate truth of always changing, never the same present moment mind. And also the truth of impermanence, impermanence. So that moment by moment, whatever uh, phenomena arises, whether it's a person, a place, a situation, a thing, uh, a sensation in the body or a thought is inherently impermanent rather than permanent by its nature. It is self-finishing. It finishes of itself, in and of itself. So it's not to be attached to. Uh, it's to be used only and experienced only, whatever sensation or phenomena one may encounter. We have uh, now about 24, 25 people, including myself, in our uh, group call in our Discord server, which is like our online meditation center. And we have uh, about eight people joining us through YouTube, watching us live. Uh, and we will also have people who come later and watch this recording uh, and participate in that way. What we are going to do today is start by singing a song together in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. 
uh, Plum Village tradition, which anyone who is here, uh, one of the more than 30 people that are here right now, uh, if you are concerned with Buddhism, meditation, enlightenment, and uh, this path, you should know about quite directly uh, Plum Village and the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh and his continuation body, which is his community. And his practice centers and practice groups worldwide are some of the best starting points and best access points um, for getting involved in the spiritual life and in spiritual practice. Finding a group near you, a Sangha near you, a Plum Village is a gold standard. Okay, and they sing practice songs together, so we will do one of those practice songs. And then uh, I will, uh, as someone who has been uh, following, involved with Zen Buddhism for the better part of 10 years, and as someone who has attended many intensive meditation retreats, and has been a Buddhist monk for the past five years, uh, I will facilitate us to go through these uh, teachings of ultimate enlightenment, truth, freedom, uh, from a text that is a compilation of teachings from Zen masters, uh, and translated by Thomas Cleary. And this particular uh, text that we will go through is from Zen Master Mazu. Zen Master Mazu. So it's possible you can look into it later. Who is this Zen Master? What's this about? So let's start with singing a song. Um, one of the projects that I like to do in this community is collect together um, a song book that we can have uh, printed out, kind of somewhat professionally printed out, and then can, can mail out uh, for the Sangha members, for the community members here, so that when we use a chant or we do sing a song together, uh, you can have something uh, right there with you to use. And we have also just made in the Discord server a new role and a new section for volunteering. So those people who have the interest to volunteer, uh, please reach out and let us know. Uh, the caretakers or the long-term members of our community, let someone know or reach out to me and say, hey, I know how to edit videos, or hey, I know how to edit audio or make pictures, or I could help compile that songbook, or I, you know, I would like to take on some volunteering role according to my abilities, and we will um, facilitate you to get that volunteering role, and you can do good deeds concerning with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, our little Sangha that we have here. But for now, we are going to, uh, to start with singing a song. And this song is called, Here is the Pure Land. Here is the Pure Land. I'm not sure if anyone um, here knows this song. And I'm not, I'm not, we're not super equipped to just put it on your Google Glass or your VR. You know, Elon Musk's implant isn't quite ready yet where I can send it to you and you'll have the songbook in front of you uh, visually, right? So, you know, we're just going to have to accept it, not to get too caught up in the technicalities of it. Um, so the song goes like this. Here is the pure land. The pure land is here. I smile in mindfulness and dwell in the present moment. The Buddha is seen in an autumn leaf. The Dharma is a floating cloud. The Sangha body is everywhere. My true home is right here. Breathing in, flowers are blooming. Breathing out, I am aware that bamboos are swaying. My mind is free and I enjoy every moment. Okay. 
So that's the song. I don't know if anyone ha happens to have the lyrics in front of them. Um, but if you do, that's great. And otherwise, we'll sing it twice. So you can try to... There we go. We've got the lyrics. We've got volunteers actively here. And now, and I'll, I'll copy and paste that to YouTube. I think people watching on YouTube, they can have the lyrics in front of them even easier just by the nature of the platform. But there is a very strong uh, message limit there, so hold on. In this spiritual path, we should not let barriers or boundaries uh, discourage us. The barriers and boundaries are exactly the path. So, you know, this is a time to, to confront boundaries, whether they're technical or whatever they are. Sangha body is everywhere. My true home is right here. So we'll sing this twice. So the first time you can kind of listen and... Uh, get the tone of it and then the second time we sing it you can join along you can sing along with me okay is everybody ready all right here we go here is the pure land the pure land is here I smile in mindfulness and dwell in the present moment. The Buddha is seen in an autumn leaf. The Dharma is a floating cloud. The Sangha body is everywhere. My true home is right here. Let's try that part together. Okay. Here is the pure land. The pure land is here. I smile in mindfulness and dwell in the present moment. The Buddha is seen in an autumn leaf. The Dharma is a floating cloud. The Sangha body is everywhere. My true home is right here. That's the first part. Second part. Breathing in, flowers are blooming. Breathing out. I am aware that bamboos are swaying, my mind is free and I enjoy every moment. Okay, let's try that one together. The second part. Breathing in. Flowers are blooming, breathing out. I am aware that bamboos are swaying. My mind is free and I enjoy every moment. Now we're going to do the whole song together from the top. Here is the pure land, the pure land is here. I smile in mindfulness and dwell in the present moment. 
The Buddha is seen in an autumn leaf. The Dharma is a floating cloud. The Sangha body is everywhere. My true home is right here. Breathing in, flowers are blooming, breathing out, I am aware that bamboos are swaying, my mind is at peace and I enjoy every moment. Okay, so that is our uh, starting song, lighting the fire of our mindfulness and also our happiness and our joy. Uh, one major uh, teacher for modern Western people concerning the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is Ajahn Brahm. So if you are here and you are listening and you are concerning yourself with spiritual path, enlightenment, meditation, changing your life, you should know about Ajahn Brahm. You should know about his videos and his uh, resources that are available. And he likes to teach about kindfulness so that we have mindfulness, we have awareness of the body, but we're also bringing this sense of kindness towards what we are aware of. So when mindfulness and kindness come together, there's a natural sense of enjoyment, right? When someone or something is kind to us, it really feels good. It's really enjoyable. It's really interesting. And we need to, to have that interest in our practice, in the Dharma, in the teachings. It's not enough to just be here. We've got to be interested. We've got to be curious about it. We've got to be curious enough to speak up, to ask a question, to share, to exfoliate our mind with these teachings, not just hear them, but listen to them, open to them. So it would be great to hear the sound of the bell, but uh, I don't have a bell. So we're, I'm just going to clack these things together, and this will be our invitation of mindfulness. So my friends, uh, the the teaching that we are about to listen to is about as deep as it gets, about as high level as it gets. So don't be shy to not understand. Don't be shy to ask questions about what you are hearing or listening to. And uh, really take this as a very, very special opportunity to know for yourself about what is the highest standard that we can have in our understanding of the spiritual truth, of the ultimate. This will give a good and a clear example of that for everyone. Mazu said, You should each believe your own mind is Buddha.
the, this mind itself is Buddha. Buddha, we can also, we can use the word freedom. Okay, what is the Buddha? The Buddha is enlightenment. Mazu said, you should each believe your own mind is Buddha. This mind itself is Buddha. The great teacher Bodhidharma came to China from South India, transmitting the supreme vehicle's teaching of one mind to get you to wake up the supreme vehicle's teaching of one mind. So the, the vehicle, the boat that takes you from this uh, place of suffering and confusion and uh, being lost to cross the ocean, to cross to the other side of enlightenment, of freedom. So Bodhidharma came to China from South India transmitting the supreme vehicle's teaching of one mind. What is one mind? One mind is not about someone. To get you to wake up. Have you ever woken up from a dream before? He also cited the Lankavatara Sutra to seal people's mind ground, lest in your confusion you fail to believe for yourself that each of you has the reality of one mind. So the Lankavatara Sutra has Buddha's talks on mind as its source. The method of denial is the method of teaching. What is the Lankavatara Sutra? You don't know. And yet, Lankavatara Sutra, right in front of you. So the Lankavatara Sutra has Buddha's talks on mind as its source. So what is the Lankavatara Sutra? The Lankavatara Sutra is a Buddhist text that has Buddha's talks on mind as its source. The method of denial is the method of teaching. So you bring me a flower and I deny it. You bring me an idea and I reject it. You bring me a attainment or an experience that you've had and I cut it off and say that's not real. Your body is not real. Your mind is not real. You are not someone. Those who seek the teaching should not be seeking anything. Those who seek the teaching should not be seeking anything. There is no separate Buddha outside of mind. No separate mind outside of Buddha. That this mind of present moment awareness, present moment direct experiencing this living corpse is none other than the Buddha. There is no separate Buddha outside of mind. No separate mind apart from Buddha. One does not grasp the good or reject the bad. One does not stick to either extreme of purity or defilement. 
Okay, so to be in relationship with this one mind, to be someone who is concerned with seeking the teaching, seeking the guidance leading to the truth, okay, one such as that does not grasp the good or reject the bad. Good and bad arise. Light and dark arise. But one who is seeking the teaching, firstly, should not be seeking anything. And then one does not grasp onto the light or reject the dark. One does not stick to either extreme of purity or defilement, holiness or uh, ugliness, lowness, degeneracy. Realizing the intrinsic emptiness of sin, thought after thought cannot be grasped, having no intrinsic as essence. Realizing the intrinsic emptiness of error, Realizing the intrinsic emptiness of fault. Thought after thought cannot be grasped, having no intrinsic essence. Emptiness of sin, emptiness of error. If this body and mind are the body and mind of cause and effect, which certainly that is the case, however we describe it. How can cause and effect have error? How can gravity have fault? How can gravity sin? How can cause and effect be grasped? How can you grasp onto cause and effect? You are not other than cause and effect. Thought after thought cannot be grasped, having no intrinsic essence. The same as this body has no intrinsic essence. The same as a tree. Does a tree have an intrinsic es essence? Does a tree have a tree essence? Or is every, every aspect of a tree, the sun and the soil and the rain and everything else, every aspect of the tree is everything else. Everything, everything. Everything is not other than everything. Realizing the intrinsic emptiness of sin, that is, you are not someone, you are not a holy person, you are not a bad person or evil person. Realizing that, thought after thought cannot be grasped. Realizing that, thought after thought cannot be grasped. having no intrinsic essence. So the world is only mind. Myriad forms are stamped by a single truth. Myriad forms, all phenomena, all living beings and non-living beings, all experiences, mental or physical, subtle or gross, comfortable or uncomfortable, all forms are stamped by a single truth. Whatever form you see, you are seeing mind. Whatever sound you hear, you are hearing mind. 
Whatever sight you see, you are seeing mind. The one mind that is not someone or something or some place or some situation or some time. The one mind that has no intrinsic essence other than its self-essence. The essence of being in and of itself essential, inseparable, permanently impermanent. Mind is not mind of itself. It is there because of form. Mind is not mind of itself. It is there because of form. Form is mind and mind is form. Mind is not mind. The essence is not the essence. Nibbana is delusion. Nibbana is desire. You are not yourself. Just speak in accord with the time, in fact and in principle, and there will be no hindrance at all. Just be natural, practical, and unobstructed, and there will be no hindrance, no boundary at all. Enlightenment, the result of the path, is also like this. Whatever is produced in the mind is called form. Since you realize form is empty, therefore production is unproduced. Whatever is produced in the mind is called form. Since you realize that form is empty, does not have a substance to it, other than the substance of mind itself. Therefore, production is unproduced. Therefore, the way that things are right now is a living, breathing example of nothing in particular. Everything in particular is not something in particular. Therefore, production is unproduced. If you comprehend the meaning of this, then you can dress and eat according to the season, developing the embryo of sagehood, spending the time according to events. What further concern is there? Developing the embryo of sagehood. You are what you eat. What are you concerned with? What is your life about? Who are you? Not about someone at work or some food, or some situation, or some place. It is nowhere else. It is everywhere else, all at once. It is everything, everywhere, all at once, here and now. What further concern is there? Whatever is produced in the mind is called form. Whatever is produced in the mind now 
which goes without saying, but let's put it in parentheses. Whatever is produced in the mind is called form. Since you realize form is empty of a self-substance other than the essence of non-self, other than the essence of ever new impermanent nature or impermanence, since you realize form is empty, therefore production is unproduced. Therefore, that which arises is non-arising. And you realize that. If you comprehend the meaning of this, then you can dress and eat according to the season developing the embryo of sagehood, developing the embryo of one who lives according to the truth, according to not someone, not some time, not some place, according to doing good deeds continuously and limitlessly with mindfulness and detachment, developing the embryo of sagehood, spending the time according to events. What further concern is there? If you accept my teaching, listen to my verse. The mind ground is explained according to the time. And enlightenment, too, is simply peace. What are you searching for? What are you looking for? What are you spending all this energy trying to get, trying to understand? trying to open up your third eye. Those who seek the teaching should not be seeking anything. If you accept my teaching, listen to my verse. The mind ground, the fundamental ground of mind, the mind ground, the reality of this and all moments that is beyond any moment, in particular, the mind ground is explained according to the time, according to the natural situation, the mind ground is explained. According to nature, the mind ground is explained according to the time, and enlightenment too is simply peace. Free from obstruction, concrete or abstract, creation itself does not create. Okay. Uh, questions, sharing experience about what's going on. Squid, I can't hear you, so let me change my settings here. How about now? Can you try again, Squid? Again. Can you hear me One, there? I can hear you, but it's a little bit low, so give me a moment. Okay, I had my audio turned down. Um, Hold on. Question and practice. Okay, go ahead. If you feel that you not necessarily even fully understand this teaching, but even to a small degree understand it, what would be the logical next step? Well, from, from my understanding, we, we tend to have this idea of like some special experience of enlightenment. And then, I don't know, we become a millionaire or something like that. 
But my understanding is more that we have many experiences of enlightenment. We have many experiences of recognition. Some are small, some are big. And if you have a recognition of this teaching or this truth, then you should value that more than anything else, that recognizing, that penetrating into the truth, that this perspective, this embryo of sagehood, you should guard it, protect it, consider it. Now there is the path of getting involved with and concerning yourself uh, full time with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. That is uh, that is available, you know, to join the community of monks and nuns. Uh, but there are also residential practice opportunities in the United States that are more secular minded, uh, and those can also be very beneficial. But it's like. What is more important than peace? What is more important than freedom? What is more important than helping using what we have for the others, not just for ourselves, right? D dissolving this never ending self fixation. What's more vital than that? And if this is not just like okay, this is the best way I could should live my life and this makes so much sense, you know, so how am I going to do it? But that we, we recognize that the essence of reality is not about someone. That you are not someone. Now, this is really rich. I mean, this is not opening up a can of worms. It's opening up a can of rubies and emeralds and sapphires and uh you know diamonds it's finding the treasure store within you that's not outside of yourself and not outside of this moment but just like opening a a can uh, your, your can opener might not be so good and that might be a tough can and maybe you don't open cans a lot, right? So it, it's going to take some time for you to open up that can. But once it's open, you, you see, you, you know, the treasure store and kind of for yourself, you, you are starting, starting to see some of that light, that luminous luminosity that's flowing out of that can. From those rubies, those emeralds, those, <laughs> you know, these jewels that are in there. And uh, it's like, wow, this is really wonderful and, and special. And not about, not about someone. And yet I'm looking at it. I'm experiencing it. So we each, each one of us, you know, we're, we're here already. We're in Sangha. We are concerning ourselves with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha in a, in a certain degree. We are here, and we know about some of the great masters. We have Bhante here to help guide us and support us as well, right? So... We, we are doing the work and we are in a special situation, but it's how do we, how do we take that generosity to the next level? How do we start just giving away everything? And that more means to give continuously, to become a giver rather than a taker, to start using the non-self power. And then slowly but surely that can starts to open. And we get these glimpses of this treasure store that, that is inside of each and every one of us. And it, it encourages us to just go further and further. And now we're into this place of creativity, cooperation, 
sharing and is very special work that we are here to do. And it's not just about you. When Until you realize that you are not someone, well, I, I mean, everything's about you. One way or another, everything's about you. And that means that the situation is very limited in terms of what you can do because your body and mind are limited. Your needs are limited. Your desires are limited. Your fears are limited. So also the way that you live your life will be very limited. But once you start to recognize that you are not someone, there is a unlimited door that opens up and we can start to help the others, use our body and mind for the others. We, we can start living our life concerned with the truth rather than our ideas, our stories, our desires and fears. And from my side, this is not about me. So what I do and what I have, and even the experiences that I, you know, like some things and I don't like some, th some things are to be used only and experienced only. And actually not to be done for myself, but to be done for all. And it feels uh, maybe unsettling or inauthentic at the beginning. And a lot of the masters talk about this. A lot of the, the ancients, the Zen worthies talk about this. At the beginning, it starts to feel like inauthentic or we're putting on, you know, we're putting on airs or we're putting on a show in some sense, right? But eventually, you become that way. You are that way. You live that way. You just don't see it. You don't recognize it. And so that, that feeling of inauthenticity is actually you being authentic. You being vulnerable, you being generous, you untangling rather than attaching. And then there's this true self that starts to reveal itself, this true self that is not about you. There are a lot of ways that we can move forward, but I am mainly looking at building intentional community, uh, concerning myself with the great teachers, uh, the practice of meditation, the practice of virtue, and the, the, the practice of insight or incorporating insight into our, uh, our work or our activities. But especially intentional community has been something important to me for a long time. And it's also been one of the main healing factors and supporting factors for me to develop. Maybe the, definitely the number one factor is being in community. Just like we're in community right now, in a certain sense. But that can, that will, for sure, that will develop more. to conduct retreats or to open a uh, in-person meditation center.
it's it's strange for if 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 I am coming from a Western background, it it makes sense to be in community, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to be in community as it is concerned with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And the Buddha is not is representing this almost like a stable enlightenment. Not spiritual enlightenment, not kundalini enlightenment, not uh, this, you know, this kind of super ego, spiritual entertainer, yoga, you know, multiple wives, sex cult enlightenment, right? Or we just, we're just going to do it. We're just going to go out and be enlightened and change the world. But the, the real ending, the cessation, the finishing, that is not about someone and recognizes that the cause of someone is ignorance and attachment, or that the cause of suffering is desire, craving, so that we can stop and we can start through that stopping. We can cooperate through that stopping. We can communicate through that stopping. We can rely on the Buddha. We can rely on the power of the Buddha. So also we can rely on the power of the Dhamma and rely on the power of the Sangha as well. I, I, would, I would be curious for people to bring, bring up or share with me like ultra high level gold standard uh, spiritual masters or teachers that are alive and kind of active today or recently that are not concerned with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha in some sense. I mean, a couple names might might come up, uh, but most of them that most of them that I'm aware of are like the secular mindfulness teachers, Jan Kabat Zinn and Sharon Salzberg, or um, there's a lot of these different people that are super high level are really informed by Buddhism. And when we look at someone like Thich Nhat Hanh, I mean, the Plum Village centers, Plum Village in France or uh, the Deer Park Center, these communities are just absolutely essential powerhouses for healing and growth. I mean, bring bring up some of their monks, Sister Diang Niem, uh, Brother Fab Lu, Te Fab Lu. Uh, I mean, so I know Western as a Western person, you know, we don't want to be religious. We don't want to concern because we're educated. Educated people tend to be arrogant. And if you're arrogant, you're comfortable with what you have and you look down on what is other than that. And it also brings up like a greediness and a, a, a reliance on your complicated thinking that's not necessarily practical for all. It might be practical for you, but it's not practical practical for all, and it's not wisdom informed. So starting to concern ourselves with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is a really uh, useful point, I think. It's a really useful point. I, of course, I'm getting a lot of benefit. I'm a monk. Uh, so I, you know, full time, I'm concerning myself with that. And so the, the new channel that we've opened up in the Discord which is kind of, it's this discord is an expression of our intention and our uh, involvement with the community of practice that we have and how we can collaborate and, and work together to do good deeds, to practice meditation, to develop wisdom. So this volunteering is very much to do uh, works and activities concerned with the Sangha, the Sangha we have here, but also the propagation of Dhamma. And, you know, this kind of potential to become enlightened or to become free from suffering. Because the wisdom is the insight into the true nature. So the wisdom is the insight that you are not someone. 
whether you have mental health problem or suffering or whatever, you are not someone. So that's kind of later on, you know, <laughs> we're not going to go down to uh, Skid Row and start saying you are not someone to all the people there, you know, who are in great suffering. That's, that's not how it works. But so the wisdom is that aspect. The Dhamma is the, the skillful teachings that lead us to wisdom. And the virtue is what allows us to heal and to support each other in healing as well. So here we are mainly concerned with virtue. Our intentional community here is mainly concerned with virtue. And meditation is like the highest virtue. And we're practicing wisdom-informed meditation here. Because uh, I am concerning myself with the real meditation masters. Uh, and so that's how I'm sharing and facilitating and what I'm making use of. And that's the standard we hold in this community. So we're practicing wisdom and form meditation, but mainly our group is concerned with the virtue. And so virtue is a matter of what we don't do, such as the five precepts, don't kill, uh, don't steal, don't lie or speak harshly, don't commit sexual misconduct and do not uh, take drugs or intoxicants. So what we don't do, and these are not shallow or vague. This is, you know, uh, put a billboard outside your house with these five things on it and study them and think about them and digest them and make it your, li a your life to be virtuous. So it's what we don't do, but it's also what we do. And the same goes with meditation. How, how far are you willing to go? How, how much are you willing to step forward in terms of changing your life? But the, the other side of virtue is to do good deeds. It's the active, it's the volunteering, it's the donating, right? So many people here are, or some people here are supporting me regularly by making monthly contribution. And then some people make donation to me to support me. And we also have a kind of general fund that we've made use of before. So we use that to help our Sangha members if something comes up. And maybe if we do some book distribution, we can also use that. Uh, but we can consider how to do more volunteering, how to do more good deeds, such as helping with the website or helping to uh, host sessions here or to collaborate, you know, and, and this is not easy to do. But this is what we should do. With our insight, with our understanding, with our mindfulness, with our wisdom, we should do good deeds more and more and more and more and more. We should be on the edge of our seat. What are we going to do? How are we going to show our commitment? How are we going to show up for this community and this practice? Now, a big way that a lot of people show up is by being ready to join these sessions. I mean, we had two hours notice. We had a short bit of notice. And this isn't like a 15-minute composed video or something that you can tune in and watch that's about your favorite celebrity or you know, story arc that's going on. This is training the mind. This is uh, virtue, meditation, and wisdom. So to be ready to show up here and, and be here is definitely a big practice that we do. But we can do a lot more. And the deeper benefits that are going to come up from having that taste or that seeing into the can that's full of rubies and sapphires and emeralds that are luminous in and of themselves. They are self-shining. The mind is uh, shining in and of itself. The essence of mind is brightly in and of itself. 
once you start to see that, it's how to find continuous practice. How to practice continuously. How to show up again and again and again and again and again. How to do good deeds. How to detach from someone, some place, some time, some situation. How to be mindful continuously. There's an experiment that a scientist did. Some kind of unethical experiment. But... It was about rats and drowning. So there's one experiment where they put some rats or some mice into a bucket of water and they let them just kind of uh, swim in there until they drown, something like that. So after 15 minutes, they, they drown, All right? Now, the next experiment was that they took those mice and they did the same thing, but right before they drowned, they took them out and they dried them off and cleaned them up and, and, and got them fine, okay? And then they put them back in the water. Do you know how long they swam at that time? Something like 18 hours. They swam continuously. They went beyond their limitations. So we need to take ourselves to the limit point so that we can go beyond our limit point. We need to take ourselves to the brim, to the edge of self-power so that we can start to acquaint ourselves with no self-power, the power of no self. And concerning ourselves with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is one of the surefire ways to do that. Being around the Buddhist monks and nuns, joining in the meditation retreat, visiting the temple, having spiritual friendships with well-minded practitioners that are ongoing. Breathing in and breathing out. So I don't know if you're still here, but uh, I hope that was a helpful response. It was extremely helpful. I, I had a bunch of questions in the middle of that, but you kept repeatedly answering them. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, how can you incorporate mindfulness and meditation into daily life to improve mental well-being? Follow the five precepts and prioritize doing good deeds more and more. And whatever I said before as well. We have to keep trying. We have to keep showing up. We have to make sure we are trying and showing up at the right place which is not any particular place right now. We will read a little bit more here from this text. And then we won't finish this text today. We'll continue it tomorrow uh, at this time. Most likely, we, we will see. A monk asked, how does one cultivate the way? 
How does one cultivate the way? The master said, the way is not in the province of cultivation. A monk asked, how does one understand the truth? This is my paraphrasing. The master said, the truth is not in the province of understanding. The truth is not in the province of cultivation. If you speak of attainment by cultivation, whatever is developed by cultivation also decays. Thus, you are the same as a disciple. But if you say that means no cultivation, you are the same as an ordinary person. Okay, so if you speak of attainment by cultivation, some special experience that you can get, some deep meditation, etc., that you grasp, that you, you know, I've developed this power, this experience. Uh, if you speak of attainment by cultivation, whatever is developed by cultivation also decays. So it is by itself not reliable, not, you know, it's like holding up your phone and saying, hey, this phone is not reliable. You want to buy it? No, I don't want to buy that phone. I would like to purchase a reliable phone. So thus, you are the same as a disciple. You are a follower. Your point is not, not the point of a teacher. Not the point of a representative of the truth or the essence. But if you say that means no cultivation, you are the same as an ordinary person. So if you reject cultivation, you are, all, you are the same as an ordinary person, because this is what ordinary people do. They don't cultivate the way. They don't develop the way. So it's not about, doesn't mean no cultivation either. The monk also asked, by what understanding can one attain the way? By what understanding can one attain the truth? The master said, your own nature is originally complete. Just do not linger over good and bad things, and you can be called a practitioner of the path. To grasp good and reject bad, contemplate emptiness and enter concentration is all in the province of contrived action. If you then seek outwardly, you will become further estranged, increasingly remote. Just end mental calculation of the world. A single moment of thought is the root of birth and death in the world. Just don't have a thought, and you remove the root of birth and death. Then you gain the supreme treasure of a sovereign of truth. One more time, and then we'll sing a song. Just end mental calculation of the world. A single moment of thought is the root of birth and death in the world. Just don't have a thought, and you remove the root of birth and death. Then you gain the supreme treasure of being a sovereign of truth. Then you gain the supreme treasure of being a ruler, a monarch an emperor, an empress of truth. And try to remember this isn't just about sitting quietly somewhere or, you know, being stuck in a meditation retreat or something like that. It is not to cling to the good or reject the bad. So let's uh, finish with a song, my dear friends.
Well, we'll sing a song and see if anyone has a question after that. Okay, we're going to do We're All Moving. We're All Moving. Uh, maybe someone can bring that those lyrics up. This is a very fun song, and it's also a very deep song. Uh, okay, so it goes like this. We are all moving on a journey to nowhere. Taking it easy, taking it slow. No more worries, no need to hurry. Nothing to carry, let it all go. Very good. See, Kaloyan, thank you for your support. This is really helpful. And I'll share that to YouTube. I'm going to share the lyrics for everyone. Okay, so I'll sing it once and you can listen and get the tone. And then the second time that I sing it, uh, you can sing along with me. All right. And we can also snap our fingers to this song. This is a good snapping finger song. This is also a Zen practice to sing this song. All right. We're all moving on a journey to Taking it easy, taking it slow, taking it slow. No more worries, no need to hurry, nothing to carry. Let it all go, let it all go. Not too tough, not too difficult, right? Can everyone hear snap? All right, let's let's try to sing this song together. We're all moving on a journey to nowhere. Taking it easy. Taking it slow, taking it slow No more worries, no need to hurry Nothing to carry Let it all go, let it all go Again We're all moving on a journey to nowhere Taking it easy Taking it slow Taking it slow No more worries No need to hurry Something to carry Mindfully, mindfully. Okay, uh, any questions or sharing experience? Okay, Hoshi, can you speak up? Use your microphone. I mean, I, I can. Um, so just, what is, maybe I'll recall, I've got one eye bleed shut because of a migraine. What is correct to do when in so much pain I can barely think or focus? Um, do, do I just accept it and dwell with it until it passes even if it stops me from doing 
Like this, this stopped me from a responsibility I had on the weekend, for instance. Um, what is the correct way to confront this kind of thing? Well, your, your responsibility is to be mindful. Your responsibility, your responsibility is to detach. Your responsibility is to do good deeds. Valentine, we cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Your responsibility, Hoshi, is to be mindful. Your responsibility is to do good deeds. Your responsibility is to detach. So you, you actually, you're carrying the answer with you about this situation or this, this teaching there. You are adding on an extra layer of suffering to something that you are just to be mindful of and to detach from. Oh, I have this responsibility. Oh, this pain shouldn't be here. Oh, you know, this extra layer. Yeah, pain is there, but it is to be mindful of only. It's to be used only. It's to be experienced only. And that pain will help you to detach. Being mindful of that pain will help you to, to recognize that your responsibility is to detach, not to attach. The more that you attach to the body and the mind or this, you know, quote unquote responsibility, these social contracts we make up, the more we are going to be ignorant and attached, ignorant and suffering. So you should be mindful of that pain and don't add any extra layer of judgment or what you should do or what you shouldn't do or your you know, responsibility. Your responsibility is to just be mindful and to detach. And self-care, of course, to lay on the couch. But sometimes, you know, the couch isn't going to do you any good. So it's most important is to be mindful and detached. Makes sense because I, I feel like I'm doing harm by failing to do what I said. No, no, no. You you can do as much as you can do. You also have to detach from the person that you are helping. Helping only, doing only, experiencing only. This is a tough world. And and you know, it's like we we, we have this ideal in our minds about what a hospital looks like or what fair treatment is for someone. Right? We want everyone to have a fair shake. Well, look, you go over to um, my teacher's temple in, in Myanmar, to Barwa Center outside Yangon, where there are thousands of people. And many of them are sick and disabled and addict and suffering or mental health. They don't get a fair treatment. And people say, well, what's going on here? Why, you know, what kind of organization is this? Take that person to the hospital. You come and take them to the hospital. People are doing as much as they can do. It, you know, and what hospital are you going to take them to in, uh, in Myanmar, right? Or in a, in a third world country? So we can do as much as we can do. If you are, the situation that you're in is to be used only and experienced only. We have to develop our detachment power. Even if it's, it's our loved one, our precious one, that we want to help or support or be there for them. Um, helping them, being successful in helping them is to be experienced only, to be mindful of only, and to be used for detachment. Not being able to help them, failing, uh, you know, you not being uh, there when they needed you most is to be experienced only and used only. That's life. So if you, if you create like a ball and chain about that person or that place or that situation, um, 
you know, you're just wasting your energy and wasting your life. We have to know how to how to detach from someone at some place at some time because we're getting into these interpersonal relationships. It's just a bunch of hogwash for the most part. It's it's contracts. It's social contracts that we are, you know, developing and establishing and then are weighing us down and forcing us, giving us this energy where we feel forced to use our self power. We, we have used our self-power too much. We should emphasize using no self-power. Okay, and especially, you know, in the West, we don't believe in, it's not just about the West. I mean, it's, it's in a transactional society or a transactional situation. It's all about you getting what you want or the business owner or the person in charge or the person who needs help getting what they want or you as the helper getting what you want. You have to detach from that system so that you can be mindful of ever new impermanent nature. So that you can be mindful about the truth, which is not someone. You don't even know if that person is alive or dead right now. But we think, oh, it's about someone. Oh, it's this story. Oh, it's that, you know, this is this person to me, etc. It, you, it's we're just making it up. It's ignorance and attachment. That doesn't mean so those people, those contact points, the people that need help or just the regular people are to be used only and experienced only for mindfulness and detachment, for doing good deeds, for doing actions of generosity. But the interpersonal transactional relationships are uh, weighing us down and keeping us from seeing the true nature. Right? That person is not someone. I'm sorry, but that's the, you know, that's the reality. My, my nephew that I love very much is not someone. So this is not to reject. When we, when we hear this teaching, when we start working with it, we think, okay, now I need to reject my children. No, I mean, that's not at all what this teaching is talking about. It's to start using the power of the truth. It's to start using the power of the original truth, which is, you know, everywhere. It's right here. It's right now. It's right in front of your face. And it is reliable. We need to develop our faith and our trust in the truth, which is not someone for sure, not something in particular for sure, and not some place for sure. We get these flashes or we get these experiences or we get tangled up. We get tangled up in someone. We get tangled up in something. We get tangled up in some place. Well, that place is not some place in itself. That person is not someone in themselves. That thing is not something in itself. It is just ever new impermanent nature. Okay, we don't reject, but we don't attach either. That means we detach, and that means we are also not taking on extra. We are not seeking outside. So it can be you turn off your phone, or you get into the bathtub, or you put your headphones in, you use a blindfold, 
you lock your door, that's fine, that's good, as long as it's not to reject. To, to lock your door and put on a blindfold and put on your noise-canceling headphones or whatever you, you can use or get in a bathtub, whatever you have, okay? It, it's to be used only and it's to be experienced only. If it's to reject, then there will be many side effects. If it's to reject, then you are actually seeking outside by doing that activity. Because you're trying to get away from this to go over there to that. So it's to be used only and experienced only. And to do that, you need to use the power of mindfulness and detachment. Present moment awareness of the suffering that you're experiencing. The physical suffering. Physical pain that you're experiencing. Mindfulness of it. And then to detach, to uninvolve with the involvement itself. And then also to uninvolve with the uninvolvement itself. Because it's just, just like that pain. It just, it comes up in itself and it goes away in itself. Arising and passing. Just and mental calculation of the world. And it's so easy that saying it obscures it, obstructs it. It's just a nature. Just end mental calculation of the world. A single moment of thought is the root of birth and death in the world. Just don't have a thought. Just don't be serious about it. Just don't have a thought, just don't be so serious about it, and you remove the root of birth and death. Whatever is produced in the mind is called form. Since you realize that form is empty, that form is truly impermanent, truly empty of a real true person and a real true story, which it just naturally is, just like we said, I don't, you don't know if that person's alive or not, let alone if you met their needs or something like that. You don't know. Whatever, whatever is produced in the mind is called form. You are producing in the mind, producing in the mind. Since you realize form is empty, therefore production is unproduced. The seed of cessation is apparent in its arising. The ending is the ending in itself. The arising is the ending in itself. Even the produced is unproduced. Even the situation is not the situation. If you can use this person when you are able, it's just like you don't drive a car when you're not able to drive a car. If you can use this person when you're able to do good deeds more and more, then that's great. But if you are to get involved in transactional relationship or to use with attachment, to use with out mindfulness, then you should detach from that person or that place or that situation. And you should do it even in the midst of doing it.
Just be mindful. Dare to be mindful as this bubbling up of the self tries to take advantage or take control. Dare to be mindful. Dare to detach. Not to reject. It's just to be mindful. And in this case, to be mindful of that pain, but that's also going to help a lot to show you and to experience this is not to be relied on. This is not to be attached to. And the same with the mental situation or the mind situation with this person. It's painful. It's unpleasant. It's not to be attached to. It's not to be relied on. So be mindful of that unsatisfactoriness. Okay, and breathe with it. Breathe in peace, breathe out love. Breathe in awareness of that tension, that tightness, and breathe out a relaxing and untangling of it. Offer your attention to the tension and release, reduce, relax it. Relax in the process, relax your reactivity to it. Okay. Okay, uh, so we have two questions. Uh, Kaloyan is asking about uh, how to know which teacher is the right one. Um, I, I had one master tell me about this, that you, you don't choose your teacher, your teacher chooses you. So, you know, being the right one is, I think, probably more than anything, a matter of the ego, right? It's a matter of you know, the self-importance that you're giving to yourself. You are not someone. And how far you want to get involved in this is completely up to you. Um, if you want to make use of a teacher, then you need to be close to them. You need to show up to the space. Right? This practice is not a spectator sport. You want to know about a teacher, but you better be ready to book a ticket. The savings, the savings that you have in your bank, the money that you have, is to be used only and experienced only uh, for walking this path. That's the most important thing. Most important thing. So... You learn what a good teacher is by meeting uh, bad teachers, medium teachers, good teachers, great teachers. But it's not about you or your judgment. It's about you having an experience that is not about you. And you can watch their conduct and watch how they live if you are close to them, but if you are just a spectator, if you're just observer, then you just listen to their teachings and you use it. That's it. If you can't use it, you don't, you know, what are you doing? Okay, Kaloyan. So you come to, uh, come to Hanoi. And you'll come to meet the meditation master here, and then you, you will see, you can ask him this question, all right? You also need to be, you need to be ready to go out and wander out and stretch out to different people who are available to you. Right? I am available to you. Ajahn Brahm is not available to you. So you can talk to me. You can't talk directly to Ajahn Brahm. But if you book a ticket and go over to Australia and somehow get your way over there, 
then that's where you'll be and you can try. But we have to make use of what's in front of us. And we also have to be generous in terms of how we consider one another. It's like it, it, people don't seem to be very skillful to have a conversation most of the time about some experience they've had or some concern that they've had or something that came up. So we need to dare to share our experience and understanding with one another and ask what the other person thinks or, you know, this point or this concern that they have. You just communicate. And you have to also use your... In this way, you will learn about your power and your ability, not just your privilege. So when you start opening yourself up and putting yourself out there and, and checking the other, then you will be checked. Right? Because... You are relying on your mind, you are relying on your thinking and your perceptions, but your mind and your perceptions and your thinking may not be particularly strong if you actually bring it out. So, in that case, you need to bring it out so that you can you can know what, what power it has or what value it has what relevance it has, so that you can know like, oh, that person didn't fight, you know, that person didn't punch me in the face because I said something, but clearly what I said was not true or did not have power, did not have the, the truth in it, much truth in it. It was uh, shallow. So we have to learn about that through through our sharing and, and putting ourselves out there, body and mind as well. Finding a teacher is not a matter of finding the right YouTube video to watch. It's putting yourself out there, giving giving yourself up, sharing your experience. And it's especially not about you getting what you want. The teacher is not there to give you what you want. The teacher is there to help you in ways you don't know that you need to be helped. Just like a doctor. And you, you may not be willing to be helped in that way as well. We, we can all teach each other something, but we should focus on generosity and doing good deeds in a practical way more and more, rather than finding a teacher or teaching the others. Okay, uh, Nicole, you want to speak up? You want to share a little bit about your experience? Maybe don't, don't worry too much about getting an answer. If there's a question in, in there, that's okay. But I think sharing your experience is even more, more vital, more interesting from what I read. So please. There's some connection, there's some audio. Maybe you, you might need to like turn off your camera and hold your phone up to your your face. Can you hear me now? That's better. Um, basically, I, I was kind of sitting with this 
it is a bit of a bone to pick with with that. Um, and I'm trying to apply this to my life because I used to view something like vacay as and just the fact that the mom, you know, So I think the audio is not, not suitable right now. So Nicole said, I'm trying to apply this to my own life as I used to view Reiki as an act of a good deed and just a practice of the mind, but I'm wondering how to let go of this even if it was me emptying my mind and feeling. It has helped during very painful moments, so I'm wondering what to do or rethink with this. I think don't think about it too much. I think don't worry about it too much. You may find that that avenue is less practical for you now because you're learning ways to do good deeds that are more grounded or actionable or direct. You can still keep it in your toolbox, right? You you can still have it nearby you, but you don't need to emphasize it too much because in the past you already, you know about the power of Reiki. You are experienced in that, but you, you maybe know less in terms of doing good deeds and in terms of acting out spiritually, skillfully. You may know less about not using the power of not using Reiki and not involved with Reiki. So you just exercise that, that power rather than thinking about it too much. And maybe you will come back to it or use it here and there or something will, because these, these healing modalities can have a lot of value as well, but they tend to be, maybe Reiki tends to be used for people who are not, um, not in great need of, not, not having access to other healing modalities. So, people who already have access to Reiki's or Reiki getting that kind of healing, like they're in that circle, they know about those traditions, uh, can be less important to, to help them with Reiki. So, if that's mainly who you are doing Reiki with and affiliated with, you don't need to worry too much about that because they already know about it. But there may be people who don't know about Reiki or don't have access to that healing modality. And if you were with them or volunteering in a place like that, it would make sense for you to bring that up and to try again to practice like that. Because that you're offering to someone who didn't didn't know about that that power and you also didn't know about the power of using it for someone who was in the didn't have access to other forms of medicine even didn't have access to like being able to go to the hospital or something like that so for that kind of situation maybe you practicing that will be also quite quite powerful for to understand more deeply about it but otherwise, I think you don't need to think too much about it. Just sitting, sitting with the pain, not trying to fix it. That sounds great. That's good. Sitting, sometimes the world just needs us to sit with it rather than trying to fix it. And that sitting with it allows a deeper and more comprehensive way of trying to fix it, trying to heal it, trying to take care of it. Okay. Um, my, yeah, go ahead, Michael, before your phone dies. Um, uh, the question earlier of being unable to perform an obligation due to pain. What, in my experience, what I do is, uh, I have I have two dogs and I'm I feel as though I am constantly overwhelmed with 
the obligation due to pain. But what I do is I shorten the obligation to the present moment in that when it's time to walk them, I know that I know that it's going to be overwhelming. And what I do is I just ask myself, well, can I put my shoes on? And the answer is always yes, I can put my shoes on. And can I can I tie the dog one step at a time? Yes, I can I can put the leash on the dog. I, once I start walking, it, it, it comes to my body wanting to give up due to pain. And I just ask myself, if I was being chased by a lion at this moment, would I give up? And the answer is always no, I don't ever give up. I just push my body and it never fails. And um, it isn't a great deal of pain. And I do not sleep well, depending on how much I've had to do that day or really recently and stuff. But this is where I'm at. This is, this is my middle. My doctor says I should get rid of my dogs, but I don't want to do that. So this is, this is the middle path that I think I am on. Okay, thank you, Michael. And whatever you do or don't do, just, just emphasize to do only and to experience only. Whatever lesson is there to be learned from your success or your failure is to be used only and experienced only. And you will you will learn that lesson through your experience, not through your thinking or your story about it. So if it brings up attachment in some way, that is to be, that is the detachment point. Yeah, I, I'm trying to, to uh, maintain the responsibility of a dog ownership without too much attachment. And I'm all, and also in addition to that, uh, there is an old lady that lives in my same building who has medical issues that has a dog, and I have volunteered to help her with hers. Even though I'm currently struggling with mine, the reality is that I am capable of doing it. So I, I will do it when I am asked to. Yeah, as we... As we emphasize to do with mindfulness and detachment, we can do more and more and more and more, but it takes time. We have to be patient. And as it is taking time or as we are being patient, if we get worked up in not being successful in doing what we wanted to do or even doing what we could do, then we are wasting energy and we are developing attachment. So if you could do it or should do it or would do it is less important than mindfulness and detachment. The fact that you could do it is not much important. Actually, we want to develop the capacity to do what we couldn't do. which is to be mindful, mindful and detached continuously, more and more. To recognize in this present moment experience, in this mental or physical phenomena, the truth of not someone, the truth of ever new impermanent nature, the truth of experiencing only, the truth of breathing only, the truth of feeling pain only. We can also listen to some mantra, sometime can be helpful to deal with the pain. And we can listen to a mantra that helps us to concern ourselves with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Uh, 
I'm not I'm not so good at keeping the records for these uh, ideal ideal mantras. Uh, but the the one I like is the Guan Yin Pusa. And so, let's see. Not not quite that one. I tried to find one for you, Hoshi, because you look you looked like you're in some pain, so I wanted to to find some powerful Buddhist mantra for you to listen to. I think this is the this is the good one. This is the real one. So yeah, this is the real one. Uh so <laughs> Hoshi, you can, if you've got some good headphones there, you can lay down and, and listen to this. Uh, and Guan Yin Pusa is, of course, the great Bodhisattva of compassion that uh, when we call out to her and uh, chant Guan Yin's name, then immediately she will concern herself with us and to alleviate and to calm and to settle those uh, sufferings that we may experience because Guan Yin Pusa is the great Bodhisattva that has made the vow to end the suffering uh, for all. Guan Yin Pusa has the 1,000 arms, 1,000 hands with 1,000 eyes on each hand and can see all the suffering and the hands to take care of that suffering to end it. So you can listen. It's good. If you can endure, you will get a lot of merit from that, Hoshi. So you are making a lot of merit by enduring the, the pain at this time. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? And Joe Bott over on YouTube said, sitting with it, it allows for the opportunity of not necessarily feeling better, but getting better at feeling. And I think that uh, they are talking about, they were speaking to, uh, to Nicole. All right. My dear beloved Sangha, uh, let's finish with offering the merit. Okay, sharing the merit. When we come together, listen to the Dhamma, meditation mind. Uh, when we gather together and concern ourselves with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, uh, we make a lot of merit. So we can uh, dedicate this merit uh, to all sentient beings and uh, offer it out and share it out. So we practice generosity with all the merit we have accumulated. Uh, everyone, you can bring your hands together and repeat after me. May all the merits that we have done till now be dedicated and shared out. toward all sentient beings. May all sentient beings rejoice and share in our merits. May all sufferings come to an end. And may peace shine brightly. May it be, 
May it be. May it truly be. And we can do three sadhus together. Sadhu. 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 Okay, beloved Sangha, thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, Hoshi, we all sending our merits to you. Feel good and relax. And see you all soon. And all of you YouTubers that are watching, uh, please don't be shy to leave a like. It helps more people come across uh, these live streams and these events in this community. So please feel welcome to leave a like and even to share or leave a comment. And that's a way you can support this, uh, this work. Okay, thank you for being here. Thank <laughs> you.